Hi, everybody. I'm Alicia Halliday. I'm the president of the board of the Phelan McDermott Syndrome Foundation, and I am happy to invite you to this casual conversation with Neuron Pharmaceuticals. Um, with me today is um, Megan O'Boyle, who you all know, uh, Nancy Jones from Neuron, and Larry Glass from Neuron. So I'm going to let them each introduce themselves, and then we'll talk a little bit about what Neuron is doing in this area and how they can help families with PMS. So Megan. Thanks, Alicia. Um, hello, everybody. I am Megan O'Boyle. I have a 20 year old daughter, Shannon, with Phelan McDermott syndrome. Um, it's a large deletion. And um, I do not have any uh, scientific background or experience, but I was one of the um, PMS mom volunteers that was part of the uh, launching the registry in 2011. And since then, I've had the um, ability to go to lots of different disease, um, rare disease meetings and pharmaceutical and industry meetings and FDA meetings and NIH meetings. And I've learned a little bit about, um, you know, how difficult it is to do research before drugs can be made and how difficult it is to test drugs and there's different phases. So I think it, this is a great opportunity for our families to learn more um, because it's a pretty complicated process. Um, I've also met uh, dozens, if not more, um, groups that look just like PMS. I mean, the only, if you put five different kids with five different syndromes in the same room, you wouldn't know the difference without a genetic report. And um, their lives are very much like ours. So I've come to say that we, we may be rare, but we are not unique. Um, there are thousands of families living with, with different syndromes that don't get sleep and um, deal with things like constipation and sensory issues and uh, you know not feeling pain and, and all of those things that affect our kids every day. Um, so uh, that is who I am and I'm looking forward to learning more about what, what we have to look forward to. Nancy, please introduce yourselves. And I have to say that Nancy will probably be very humble but she also has a long history in neurodevelopmental disorders and I've worked with her before we were both um, at another organization. So, but I'll let Nancy introduce herself. Hi everyone, uh, Nancy Jones. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Development at Neuron. And I've been working at Neuron since 2013 when we were starting our, our first program on neurodevelopmental disorders and Rett syndrome. Um, and I work with our Neuron team. What I do basically is to design and execute the clinical trials for our development program. And for this work, I also collaborate with um, clinician experts and community, uh, community advocacy groups. Um, and as Alicia mentioned, you know, my, my, my training and background is actually in developmental disorders. So it's actually a personal passion of mine to be working on the development of therapies that have the potential to improve the lives of those who are facing the challenges of a severe developmental disorder. Um, and ultimately, the aim is to make it possible for people to be able to live their, their best lives. So um, uh, just a brief, uh, my, my background and, and my, my PhD research is also in, uh, in a rare developmental disorder. And it's from that research that I actually was really first impressed with the importance of working with families and the role that individuals with a disorder and their families play in research. And that's certainly been a, a guiding principle for me and others at Neuron, the, the importance of the patient community as active partners in, in treatment research. I told you she would be humble, but she actually was um, a, a huge, made a huge impact on one of the founding uh, organizations or the founding programs that helps the physical symptoms of people on the autism spectrum disorder. Um, so I won't, I won't boast too much about Nancy because I want, because we have another amazing, amazing scientist and leader, Larry Glass, that I want to everyone to meet as well. Larry? Yeah, thanks Alicia, I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, I'm Larry Glass. I'm the Chief Science Officer at Neuron. I've been here since 2004 um, and have been responsible for what they call translational medicine, which is a fancy way of saying that you take new findings and information that come out of a discovery laboratory and you bring that from the laboratory into human patients. And that's, that's pretty much what I do. And we've been working for quite a while now in neurodevelopmental disabilities and uh, are, in, are in with a related drug are actually in a phase three trial in Rett syndrome right now, uh, which if it's successful will be the first drug approved for that indication. Um, 
and we're hoping that these new, new to us at any rate, uh, condition syndromes that we're focusing on will be as successful, but as successful more quickly than Rich syndrome will. Um, just, I, sorry, Alicia, I just, I just wanted to say that um, this is not the first time I'm meeting the Neuron team. Um, I actually okay. um, first met um, Larry in 2011 when I was wearing this classy t-shirt <laughs> at a conference and I actually was telling the story of my daughter's diagnosis and the need for treatments. And he met me at the stage at the end and brought me over and explained on a, on a, um, a, a, a napkin why what they were working on at the time, which is the drug that's now in phase three for Rhett, might be helpful to Phelan McDermott syndrome. And um, we've kept in touch and crossed paths ever since. But I also wanna point out that this was not a random choosing in terms of PMS or because that, you know, we've got great t-shirts. They also, they looked at our data from the registry. So thank you to all the families who filled out those surveys over the years and will continue to do that. They looked at other, you know, all the other research in this area, but they also came to us and asked about our families and the quality of life and what things are, are affecting our families and, um, you know, what flavors are our kids like. So I, I not all uh, industry partners, as they're called, um, interact with the disease organizations as early and as effectively as NERN has done. And I am really hopeful that because of that interaction, this will be a great um, partnership and hopefully great things will come from it. So that's my two cents. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. I appreciate it. Yeah, we don't do things to the way big pharma does um you know we're not run by lawyers um we uh we don't have billions of dollars uh, we're just trying to do something that's important to us and to important important to the families and uh you know that's our that's our commitment here so let's talk about this new drug or new compound that neuron is working on for specifically for people with phelan mcdermid syndrome Tell me a little bit about it. What does it do? And um, how can it help people with Phelan McDermott syndrome? What are you guys looking at? So we'll start with Larry. What does it kind of do? And then I'll switch to Nancy. How do we think it's gonna help families with Phelan McDermott? Okay. Um, Neuron was founded to develop medicines based on pieces of the IGF-1 molecule, which you may have never heard of. IGF-1 is, is a growth hormone, basically. And it has a very different role in the brain than it does in outside of the brain. Outside of the brain is responsible for the growth of muscles and bones and, and that sort of uh, developmental trajectory. But in the brain, one of the primary roles of IGF-1 is to actually support the development of the connections between brain cells. They're called synapses. And without those synapses, the brain just doesn't work properly. And across the, the whole spectrum of neurodevelopmental disabilities, all of them, all of them have uh, deficits in cell-to-cell -cell communication that are related to the formation and function of these things that are called synapses. And um, what the drug does is it targets the role of IGF-1 in the brain. And I'll get to that in a minute because it isn't IGF-1, but I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. And it makes the, the environment of the brain more normal, more susceptible to proper development of synapses of which enable the communication between cells. Now I said that, that there, it's the role of IGF-1, but in the brain, unlike in the, in the, in the rest of the body, IGF-1 is, um, is broken down, call it metabolized into pieces very quickly. It, it doesn't play a role strong will in and of itself in the brain because it's not there very long but it's broken down into into pieces which which are called metabolites um, and 
what Neuron does is to make synthetic versions, copies basically of those, we call them analogs. Um, and we try to improve them so that they're, for example, orally available. So you can take it as a liquid or a pill rather than, rather than have to have it injected like IGF-1 is. So the drug that we're developing now, which is uh, called NNZ2591, is a copy of a molecule that's directly derived from IGF-1. And within the IGF-1 pathway in the brain, there's a lot of interaction between various components and those components actually regulate each other. And what this molecule does is it actually determines how available IGF-1 is to support synapses. So synaptic development and function. So, you know, if there's too much IGF-1, which is quite rare, um, it will reduce the amount of, of IGF-1. If there's not enough, it will improve the availability of IGF-1. And, and what we've seen in mass models thus far is that it actually corrects the, the formation and function of the synapses in a way that uh, is dependent on what's needed so that if the synapses, as in Rett syndrome, are very sparse, uh, there aren't enough of them, they're not very mature, it actually helps to grow new ones. Um, that's also true in Thalem McDermott syndrome, where there are too few synapses and they're, they're not maturing properly, they're not well developed, and they're inhibiting the communication between neurons. But in Fragile X, for example, there are way too many connections and the drug does the exact opposite, is it actually reduces the number of, of synapses, of, of dendro, dendritic connections. So this is a drug that is being used, or this is a, a target that's being used across different neurodevelopmental disorders that involve synaptic, what's called pruning or arborization. If you think about it, I always think about it as a tree in the summer, it, they grow out. In the winter, they grow back. Um, but um, I think it's important for people to know that this isn't specifically targeting the shank gene, the shank three gene. But that's okay because there are, it, as 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 um, Megan said, while PMS is rare, it's certainly not unique. And so, um, in addition to thinking about gene therapies, which is which is another an, another avenue with which PMSF is actively um, trying to engage in. There's also the idea that you can use drugs that treat common elements across rare genetic disorders associated with neurodevelopment. Nancy, what, mm -hmm. it, um, what are some of the things that you guys are looking at um, to change? So what are the things that you're gonna be looking at in people who participate in this, in this first study? Yeah, and so based on how we think it works and the fact that it's improving the sort of connectivity uh, in the brain, um, you know, it obviously uh, can be helpful across a range of symptoms. Um, for a clinical study, obviously we're also, um, it's important to us to look at symptom areas that are important clinically to the individuals and also to the families. So it'd be things like communication, finding gross motor uh, function, behavior issues, uh, ultimately, um, learning uh, in the long run, and then, of course, associated issues uh, like medical issues like GI or sleep or seizures. Uh, based on what we've seen uh, in the animal model, these things are possible. We don't have the data yet in, in, uh, in, in the patient population. That's, that's what the first study is basically designed to kind of look at. So just quickly, without getting into too many overwhelming details, um, Larry, can you tell us a little bit about this, this new study? So um, how many families are you looking for? Um, you know, here in the world. Oh, don't worry about dogs, babies or people or other children screaming. We ignore that. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, well, I will go uh, close. Tell me a little bit about it. So, so when you start, when you, and the timeline. So when you start to really want to get families involved, what can they generally expect? And I, I can jump in there if you need to close your door. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Nancy. Oh, 
Um, so just as a the global plan, we, we are planning um, a phase two study that's planned to start later in this year. And just to explain what that is, um, when you do clinical studies that go in phases, your phase one uh, is when you're looking at uh, usually um, uh, human volunteers just to check safety. And a phase two study is a small to moderate sized study uh, in the patient population. And the aim is really to, to look at safety, to confirm that it's safe, and then also to explore the effect of the drug to see, as I mentioned previously, to see um, what types of things can actually change uh, with, with the treatment of, of the drug. So we're, we're currently getting ready for the, um, for the study start. Uh, preparing what's required, which is uh, with the FDA and an investigation of new drug application, uh, which we'll be working on in the summer, and then doing all of the um, preparation in terms of qualifying the sites and investigators uh, and uh, preparing for things like ethics review. This all has to be done uh, as, you're, as you're preparing for the, for the study. Um, uh, well, Larry, I don't know if you want to jump in or want me to just uh, keep going yeah, a little bit about the study. Yeah, let me just make one point in here, and then you you talk more about the study. Um, going back to this issue of you know looking at a broad range of symptoms across a bunch of different uh, syndromes, in the mouse model, which is is the same mouse model that everybody who's doing research in Phelan McDermott syndrome uh, uses, um, it did grow new dendrites. It it improved the connections between the neurons. And when it did that, it actually changed the chemicals that are signals of communication between the, between the, the brain cells. And we looked at a range, I think it was eight different uh, symptom areas, motor function, seizures, uh, anxiety, cognition. We looked at a whole range of things in the, in the mouse model. Every single one of them was normalized. So we got a, basically a perfect score. Um, and, and that's the rationale for looking very broadly at the core symptoms and, and behaviors that are a part of Phelan McDermott syndrome is that we're not just treating, you know, we're not just coming in and treating headaches or seizures or constipation or, or anxiety. We're looking to treat the whole thing. You know, when they when people ask us what do you treat what what we treat is Phelan McDermott syndrome and I, I think families can relate to the domino effect so again no scientific background from this one but um you know if my daughter could communicate what she needed or felt her behaviors would be better mm -hmm. her behaviors are the way she has to communicate which I'm constantly pointing out in IEP meetings um but also you know if if muscle tone was affected, would that help with constipation? If um, coordination was affected, she could better communicate it on an iPad. I mean, I think there's just so many, um, you know, uh, related things that our kids go through. I think parents have all often thought is, you know, the seizures happening at night because of lack of sleep, because of reflux. I mean, it's all kind of tied in, um, you know, right. and so it, <laughs> it's just, the, the thought that it would do more than one thing um, makes total sense. Um, so that's really exciting. And for this Nancy. next project, oh, I wanted to ask a question mm -hmm. for this next project. So um, what will the design be? Will some people get a control? Will some people not get the drug and some people will get the drug or how is this gonna work for this particular study? Yeah, so this is um, phase two, what's called an, an open label, an open label study, which is which means that everybody gets assigned to the, the active treatment, which is, which is the drug uh, during the study. Um, it'll be in a pediatric population. It's, um, it's an oral dosing, it's a liquid formulation, uh, and it'll be an open label trial and with the 12 weeks of treatment on the on the on the target on the target dose um, with uh, multiple sites um, participating. Um, and uh, as we've already been mentioning, you know, in terms of the aims of the study, you know, the, you are primarily looking again to look at safety. You want to confirm that it's, it's safe in the patient population, um, and also to do pharmacokinetics, which we haven't mentioned. But it's really like how is the drug absorbed and used by the body? How is it distributed? Those are important information you need to have at this phase. And then also looking at uh, the efficacy, which you want to see what types of things change, and it helped us um, to, to prepare for the, the studies to follow, and helps us also. Um, also that we've got the correct for, for larger studies to follow. 
I am sure that families are hearing about this and thinking, okay, what does that mean? How do I get involved? What, wh how is this gonna work? Um, so I do wanna say that a lot of these details will be shared with you soon. So I'm as curious as, as you guys are about some of these details. And so they will come out soon. Um, but we wanted to kind of give everyone kind of a, a, a sneak peek into what's gonna happen. Um, do you have any sense of a timeline and also what areas of the world this study is going to be um, recruiting for? Um, it's going to be uh, in the U.S. and just uh, to the point on the timeline, it's planned to start in later in the, uh, this year. Um, and we will, as you said, we'll be um, providing more detailed information in due course and as we get closer to the study start. Um, as new information um, comes out as we up, have updates, we will actually uh, announce those and our announcements are always uh, available on our website, which is neuronpharma.com. And if people want to sort of be proactive and, and get notifications, uh, if you go to the website, you can actually sign up for email alerts. It's under news and reports and email alerts. So if, if people wanted to, to do that now to sort of make sure they're notified when, when we do have uh, an update, that's something that they can, they can do. Thanks. And then I also know this, um, that Neuron is listed or some of the concepts that we talked about today, phase two, open label, are also in a clinical trials guide on the um, PMSF website. And I'm sure that there will be updates about this in the PMSF newsletters that go out. So um, is there anything else you wanted to share before we wrap this up? Yeah, we as to add that we really appreciate the community's interest and we're actually excited to be moving forward with development and we're looking forward to being able to keep you updated. I mean, we're hard, working hard to get things ready. That's what we're that we're, we're doing now. So we'll, we'll look forward to keeping in touch as we move along as we progress. Yeah, it's been my experience with Neuron that you guys are a great organization that is truly committed to neurodevelopmental disorders, um, not just as an organization, but from the backgrounds and the commitment that that people who work for the organization show um, and have participated in for over for all these years. So thank you for for being part of the PMSF community and for um, for all you do for families with rare genetic disorders. So thank you. And we look forward to hearing about more of this very soon. Great. Thanks so much. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.